Hey everyone, Matt here, and welcome to my first philosophy series. Today we'll be looking at Henry Bergson's doctoral thesis, Time and Free Will, an essay on the immediate data of consciousness, which was first published in 1889. This will be the first of three videos, of which each video will focus on a chapter. So without further delay, let's get started on chapter one. Bergson's first move, and it's a big one, one that the rest of the text develops on, is to draw a hard distinction between the inner world of experience and the outer world of extension. He claims that conscious states or experiences do not occupy space, and thus have no means of being measured. He uses terms like quality and intensity to describe sensations and feelings, whereas he thinks that the world of extension is divisible and thus measurable or quantifiable. Or if easier, we can think of extension as the material world. So how does he make this great initial claim that the internal world of emotions, feelings, and sensations is not measurable? It seems to me that this claim is best arrived at not by logic or reason, but a finely tuned awareness to conscious experience itself. Now, if you have an impulse to go and sign up for a month-long meditation retreat in order to enact that last claim, hold tight. It may not be necessary, although it would probably help. Let's try the difficult task of becoming mindful of sensations in themselves. As you sit in your chair and listen to this video, become aware of your experience. Careful here. Don't become aware of your experience of the computer or the chair. In fact, erase the idea of the chair, the video, and even the idea of you. What is left is the sensation itself. Without any external structures or concepts to be associated with, the sensation can only be identified with its own unique quality, shade, or tone. This indescribable feeling of experience itself is what Bergson means when he states that experience is qualitative. Now, if you had trouble with this dabble in mindfulness meditation, don't worry. The ability to access experience itself, free from concepts and associations, might indeed require you to sign up for that retreat you were thinking of. Might even require you to sign up for that retreat 10 or 20 times in the next 10 years. So if you want to understand the rest of this book, you should quit your job, become a yogi who lives in the forest. Just joking. What's important here is that we can at least begin to realize that at the bottom of every experience, experience stripped of all external associations is a unique quality, shade, or tone. So after making this observational distinction, we arrive at the main question of the chapter. That is, if the intensive world of qualitative experience is not measurable, why is it that we so intuitively believe sensation measurable? Or, in other words, why do we feel so correct in claiming that we feel more or less pain, more or less effort, etc.? Bergson will spend the majority of the chapter investigating this question, which is referred to in the text as the problem of intensive magnitude. He'll go on to show that whenever we think we're measuring a sensation or intensity, what we're actually doing is mistaking the sensation itself for an extensive structure we associate it with. Let's look at some examples of this mistranslation of quality into quantity, so we can see for ourselves that the idea of intensive magnitude is in fact a contradiction of terms. We cannot measure sensation itself as it does not occupy space. So let's try this for ourselves. Remember, we're trying to see how and why we think that a sensation can increase or decrease. Now I want you to make a fist with your hand. Begin squeezing your fist. Slowly increase your effort until you're squeezing your fist as hard as you can. What did you experience in this action? What you likely experienced during this action was a sensation of increasing effort in the hand. But did you really experience that? Let's try this experiment again. This time, as you squeeze your fist, I want you to pay attention to what's happening in the rest of your body. You will notice that as you squeeze your hand tighter and tighter, you begin to engage more and more of your body. First the muscles in your forearm contract, next your shoulder and back, now your core, your face, until eventually your entire body is engaged in the task of tightening your fist. In the first case, the sensation of effort is isolated to the hand. In the second case, with a revised attention, we can see that the sensation of increasing hand effort is actually an increasing number of muscles involved. Thus, through the measurable spatial structure of our body, we assign sensation itself a measure. Let's look at another example of this. 
This next example is one of my favorites and is one that really got me thinking in new ways as it caught me quite off guard. It has to do with psychoacoustics, that is, the perception of pitch. Deeply rooted in our understanding of pitch is the spatial concept of height. We say that one note is higher than another and one lower than another, without question. We we'll quite vividly and involuntarily experience an ascending scale as rising or a descending scale as falling. Why do we think of pitch vertically? How can a note be higher than another? This may seem bizarre at first, but let's think about this deeply. We might suggest that it's because we see notes arranged at different heights on a musical staff. Higher notes are in the upper region of the staff and lower notes are in the bottom. Although this vertical organization of notes may reinforce our spatial understanding of pitch, it still leaves the question, why were they plotted vertically in the first place? One could have represented pitch by means of colors or symbols. So the question remains the same. Why do we associate pitch with height? Another suggestion might be that the vertical ordering of pitch is due to our knowledge of frequency. Science tells us that the higher pitches are actually sound waves that oscillate or vibrate at faster rates. But even upon this knowledge, which is not given in actual experience, why should the frequency of oscillations have anything to do with height? If we think about it seriously, more oscillations per X amount of time have no clear relationship to the spatial sense of height. So what could be at play here? Try making, or imagine making, a sliding pitch with your own voice. Start at a comfortable range and lower or raise the pitch as far as you can. Like the previous experiment, let's pay close attention to what's happening in the rest of our body as we do this. As our voice attempts to reach the lower depths of its vocal range, we experience a movement of tension or effort as though we're moving the sound downwards towards the base of our stomach. Inversely, as we reach towards the upper limits of our vocal range, we feel a tension or effort rise towards our head. This spatial correlate that is our body is likely the reason we associate pitch with height. We know intuitively that high notes require a movement upwards and that low ones require a movement downwards. Say we're a species that never evolved vocal cords it's quite possible that our experience of pitch might not be thought of in terms of height. Different pitches would not feel higher or lower than one another, but differ only in feeling. What we refer to as an ascending scale might appear as only changes in color or feel, having no implications of height or other measurable properties. Okay, let's think about a different type of example. Let's try and think about those psychic states that seem to have no cause. Such states are what Bergson refers to as deep-seated psychic states. A deep-seated psychic state could be a seemingly random bad mood or an overall feeling of devastation for no apparent reason. Although these states likely have some type of cause, what's important here is that the cause is not knowable to us. Because we don't know the cause of the state, we can conclude that the cause is not accountable for the measure of the state. So how and why do we order deep-seated states as greater or lesser? Let's think of two states of which we term sadness. Keep in mind we're talking about those times we don't know the cause of the states. For example, there's bad moods and there's deep sadness. And everyone would agree that we think of deep sadness as greater or more than a bad mood. But as Bergson has argued incessantly in this chapter, psychic states in themselves are not measurable. So how is it that we say one sadness greater than another? Because we're speaking of deep-seated states here, we can, not as we did in the first two examples, associate the states with external factors. So the first move here is to realize, like all psychic states, deep sadness and a bad mood differ in kind. Think about it. Does deep sadness really feel like an amplified bad mood? Not really. These two states, upon close attention, have very different flavors to them, very different qualities. But even upon this qualitative distinction, we still think of deep sadness as greater than a slightly bad mood. Bergson will go on to suggest that a deep-seated state that we think of as greater in magnitude is actually just richer in quality. A deep sadness colors our past memories with its tone and feel. It shifts our perceptions in a certain way, staining them with its quality. Now think about a bad mood. Maybe some of our attitudes and memories are tarnished by it, some of our perceptions colored, but much of our psychic self remains unaltered. 
Bergson suggests that we think of an increasing sadness not as if it were a musician playing their instrument louder and louder, but as an orchestra acquiring more and more diverse elements and instruments. This qualitative sequence is perceived as a measurable progression to our quantitatively oriented minds. But for Bergson, it is just a change in quality that is not really measurable like that of extension. Now I know that this last example takes a little more stretching and a little more effort to make work, but I think it's valid to note that various degrees of sadness, or whatever state it is, are in fact really different in flavor. This realization that emotional states differ in feel and tone shows that they're not quantifiable in any rigid way. So now that we've looked at a couple of examples of how we're often presented quality with a quantity and how we confuse the former with the latter, you may be wondering, is quality ever given in consciousness in a way that resists all attempts of measure? If you look to the language I've been using to describe the term quality in this video, if you think about the language I've been using that can do this without implying magnitude, you might be able to guess what I'm about to say. An experience we have that resists all attempts of measure is that of color. To be clear here, we're speaking of color itself, that is hue, not saturation or value. Saturation and value have spatial correlates. Trees in the distance are less saturated in our perception than trees in the foreground. As we approach a light, it increases in value, that is, it appears brighter. But hue itself? Hue has no spatial correlate. And according to everything we just considered, this lack of a measurable framework should make it impossible to think of hue in terms of magnitude. And that's exactly the case. We don't think of green as being more than purple or blue as being less than red. Sure, we may remember the color spectrum from grade seven science class and know that colors coordinate with various frequencies of light waves. But even the knowledge that violet's wavelength interval is more rapid than red's doesn't change the experiential fact that violet is not perceived as greater than red. So there you have it, a qualitative experience that does not imply magnitude. So in chapter one, Bergson draws a hard line between the inner world of experience and the outer world of extension. He claims that our inner experiences are not measurable and challenges the common assumption that we can feel more or less of a sensation. As we learned in our examples, the magnitude of a sensation can be accredited to the spatial structure we associate it with. And as we've learned with color, when we have no possible spatial structure to associate our experience with, all we're given is quality. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for the next video, where we'll discuss chapter two, the multiplicity of conscious states, the idea of duration.